Thank you very much. If uh, you know, I'm, I'm wondering that if, if Nan is the face of Ethernet, what part of Ethernet's anatomy is left for me? <laughs> so, as Nan just said, uh, uh, success has uh, many fathers. So when I say I invented Ethernet, that annoys a lot of people because they think they invented Ethernet. And the fact is, they probably did. It just depends on what you mean when you say, I invented Ethernet. What do you mean by I? What do you mean by invent? What do you mean by Ethernet? And the question of Ethernet is a big one. It comes up all the time. What is Ethernet? I have a list. Was it a, a LAN? Was it a standard? CSMA CD, is that what I invented? Um, the use of coax in local area networking. Um, the packet format, which has endured over these decades. Did I invent that? Uh, the business model of Ethernet, and, and how do you take a LAN and make it into a business? Well, those are all uh, candidate meanings for the word Ethernet. There is one thing that's true. I named Ethernet. That's indisputable. There's a memo and everything on May 22nd, 1973. And since that time, we've learned, I learned from IDC uh, recently that in the 2011, 1.2 billion Ethernet ports were shipped. And listen carefully now, because there's language here. 1.2 billion Ethernet ports were shipped, 400 million of them wired, and 800 million of them wireless. You see, I, I grabbed credit for Wi-Fi there. <laughs> <laughs> so since uh, my career as an Ethernet person, by the way, Lan, it was InfoWorld magazine, and I was a pundit, and I, I wrote for a million people a week about the internet, many of whom remember what I wrote, and, I hope you won't rush the stage during the talk. Uh, but I've since gone meta, and I'm, as uh, Nan mentioned, I'm now professor of innovation. My, uh, the title I like better, actually, is Fellow of Free Enterprise. It's deeply ideological. And, uh, and I'm trying to make uh, the entrepreneurs at the University of Texas as supported and celebrated as our football players. So. <laughs> So we call them the Longhorn Startups in there, and we say hook them horns. Now, there are three reasons why I'm here. One is that I believe that the, uh, uh, I was here for the announcement of CE 2.0 last February, and it's really great to come and sort of close the loop and, and meet the 20 companies who have now been certified, and I think it's a very important step in the evolution of the Internet's um, infrastructure. Uh, and so I, I'm happy to come and help and enjoy the party. Second reason I'm here is that innovation is now my business, and Ethernet is, is a 40-year-old in, in innovation worth studying as an innovation, so I'm involved in that. And the third reason I'm here is that I, I was invited, and, that, and that's always a plus. Uh, so uh, I've been preparing for Ethernet's 40th, which is coming up in May, May 22nd. Uh, I was, uh, and you're all invited to come. There's going to be a party in Mountain View, California at the Computer History Museum, and I hope to see, actually there's going to be a party, a conference, and an industry briefing, and I, I hope that you'll all join us. Uh, in preparation for that, I've been working on um, what I call ether math, because for 40 years people have been asking, how did you invent Ethernet, assuming that you did? And I now have the answer to that question, and it turns out to be mathematical. That is, it was a mathematical moment involving a study of the Aloha network. I've now written a JavaScript program in Google Docs simulating the Aloha network, revealing the instability of that multi-access channel, which led to corrections, which became the CSMACD access method. And I'm making that into a lecture for my students. To, you know, the title of the lecture is How Much Math Was Required to Invent Ethernet? It turns out not very much. But, um, <laughs> but they love, the students love hearing stories about the early days, 40 years ago. And one of, one of my favorite stories, and it relates to what we're doing here, has to do with the speed of Ethernet. The original Ethernet ran at 2.94 megabits per second. I refused to round it up to three because the rounding error is bigger than the speed of the trunks of the internet in 1973. They were all 50 kilobit per second trunks. So if you round 2.94 up to three, you're, the rounding error is what the trunks were running at. So that's why I don't do it. But it turns out that was exactly the right speed. 
because five years later, we, did a, we had a traffic monitor on the Ethernets there at Xerox, and five years later, the, those Ethernets were all about 50% full on a 24-hour basis. From that, we all concluded that Dave Boggs and I did a really great job of uh, estimating the requirement for the uh, forthcoming applications of the Ethernet and thereby coming up with this number 2.94 megabits per second, and it worked out. The trouble is that's not what we did. We had a card, and we were trying to cram all the FIFOs and the controls on it, and, we, and, then, and then we decided we needed to put a CRC on it, and that took, the CRC was actually on a little piggybacked thing on the side of the board, and so where was the clock going to be? We couldn't figure out where to put the clock. There was no room on the board for the clock. And then we, uh, we remembered that there was a clock on the back plane. The system clock ticked every 170 nanoseconds. So we just grabbed hold of that clock and used that as the Ethernet clock, to clock those bits out onto the network. And if you do the math, 170 nanoseconds with Manchester encoding, which is two transitions per bit, you get 340 nanoseconds per bit, which is 2.94 megabits per second. And the fact is the applications fill the network halfway after five years only because any app that tried to use more bandwidth failed. And, and uh, so build it and they will come. Imagine if we had built a 10 megabit at the beginning, what new applications would have come sooner having had uh, with that little bit more bandwidth available. Right after uh, publishing the papers on that uh, Ethernet, uh, I was on a panel at a conference, and there were two other guys sitting next to me, and they were, I was a research person, and these were two um, you know, uh, meat-eating vendors. And they, uh, one of them was purveyor of a modem that ran at uh, 2,400 bits per second, and he was the established industry player. And then there was a startup there that had a 4,800 bit per second modem. And they were arguing, and the 2400 guy argued that you don't need 48 because the characters already go by on the screen faster than you can read. Why would you want 4800 bits per second? <laughs> and then it was my turn, and I started talking about a 2.4 megabit per second. So they laughed. That was hilarious. What they weren't realizing was there was a different kind of traffic about to be carried. That is, the argument about 2400 obtained if you were running terminal traffic, but it did not obtain if you were running packet traffic, as we ultimately did on the internet. Now, speed is not the only characteristic of a network, as you all well know. Did I just say y'all? <laughs> I'm, I'm from Texas, and so we say that. There are other characteristics. You know, the various speeds of Ethernet, 2.94, 10 megabits per second, 100 megabits per second, 1,000 megabits, uh, that would be called a gigabit per second, 10 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig, and pretty soon terabit Ethernet. That, that's just the speed dimension. But there's other dimensions which are equally important. Uh, the distance, the media, the latency, the error rates, the security, the your ubiquity, the business model, whether it's standardized or not, its cost, uh, availability, durability, upgradability, and so on and so forth. It's just not the speed. And a great example of that is a new evolution in Ethernet, which you've all heard of, of course, which is power over Ethernet. So that's not speed. That's a spec where you're delivering DC over the same copper that you're delivering the Ethernet. So that's not speed. It's another spec. I find it ironic because in the early days of Ethernet, the uh, aforementioned meat-eating vendors told me that you're, we're, no one's going to install new, net, new wires for Ethernet. No one's going to do that you're going to have to put Ethernet on the power line, which we tried to do, and it didn't work. Uh, I guess it's working now. Forty years later, it's beginning to work. I think it's ironic now that the Ethernet has so spread that now we're demanding that they put the power on the Ethernet lines the other way around. Uh, you know, did, how late did you start, Nan? Do I have a reprieve? Because I'm out of time already. I just want to know, do you want me to be synchronous or asynchronous here? <laughs> so I'm on the board of an organization called U.S. Ignite. Has anyone ever heard of that? There's one hand, two, three. So it's a, uh, a, an activity of the uh, National Science Foundation, and I'm on its board. And it has a very unusual charter. Uh, 
you know, I said build it and they will come. And by the they, I guess they mean users will come, applications will come once you provide the infrastructure. But it turns out they need a little help. That is, they need to be invited to come. Someone needs to encourage them. And so that's what Ignite is doing. Ignite is trying to look for the, ne the next killer apps for the internet. And their assumptions in that are two things. One is that this next generation internet will routinely run at a gigabit per second. That is, so for example, Chattanooga, Tennessee is now the first gig city. Every home and business in Chattanooga, Tennessee has gigabit service now in preparation for looking for a killer app for gigabit network. And the other requirement they have is that uh, the new networks will be software defined. <laughs> I heard, I, someone told me that was a controversial topic. <laughs> Dead silence upon mentioning it. Uh, in any case, I'm pretty excited about this effort to find the new killer app for the internet. And uh, I, maybe I've mentioned this uh, before, but I do it with a, a three by three matrix, which you may find useful. It's still useful. I've been using it for about a year. There's the new kinds of traffic. You know, there have been old kinds of traffic, term, uh, telnet traffic, file transfer traffic, web traffic, social traffic, voice traffic, video traffic. And each of those kinds of traffics has led to the disruption of a major industry, a long list of industries. Uh, journalism, music, newspapers, telecom, um, telex. Did you used to have telex numbers on your business cards? We don't do that anymore. Anyway, these industries have been disrupted. So the, the real question is what new kinds of traffic are we getting and what new disruptions can we anticipate? So there's this three by three matrix with my three favorite new media and three favorite new industries that are now ripe for in, uh, disruption. The new traffics, quite familiar to you, would be video, mobile, and embedded, which are now invading the internet. Uh, and then the, the industries that are ripe for disruption, these are really big ones now. Not to forget these little ones like advertising. This is big, this is education, energy and healthcare, all three crying out for disruption, and, we're, and we are about to do it to them again. And the one that I'm really excited about now, especially since I, I are a professor, is education. So now the internet is really going to take education and put it on its ear. You've heard of MOOCs, M-O-O-C-S. If you haven't, Google it up and, and start looking. It's very exciting, and, and you can watch this disruption go on in slow motion. Just like you, if you watched music, iTunes disrupt music, Amazon disrupt books, you're about to see the MOOCs disrupting higher education. One WAG has predicted that in 10 years, Harvard will have 10 million students. Uh, and they won't all live in Cambridge. <laughs> so that's, those are the kinds of uh, application opportunities that, that I'm looking at with uh, um, Ignite, but this, this now brings me actually to my closing remarks before I understand Nan has uh, commissioned a uh, hired gun to come up here and get me and Rosemary's sitting there just waiting to ask me these hard analytical questions, which I, I will be embarrassed not to answer. Uh, but let me embarrass myself even more deeply because I've detected an area where I think uh, uh, MEF needs advice, and that, I'm an advisory director, so I'm supposed to give you that advice. So here I am, gung-ho about MEF and the new CE 2.0 and the evolution of, internet, uh, of uh, inter, uh, internet plumbing, namely Ethernet. And here I am at Ignite, excited about the new possible killer apps yet to be discovered for the, the um, uh, gigabit software-defined network. And these two efforts, MEF and ONF, both members of the F family. <laughs> Doesn't it make sense, wouldn't it make sense for MEF to be talking to ONF about how 3.0 can anticipate the requirements of the new gigabit software-defined networks? Don't you think that would be a good idea? I think that. So Nan, I'm officially submitting that advice uh, to, uh, and I, Okay? okay? Yep. Because it would be so boring for that not to happen. Because it's happened 20 times before where the, the carriers 
go this way and the computer companies go this way and then the, a big unconstructive fight goes on for five or 10 years and then finally it all works out. Let's skip that boring part and just go right to it and get 3.0 to do automated provisioning and other things like that. that was that applause? <laughs> So, Rosemary, I think it would be best if I stopped now. And uh, maybe uh, you can make it more interesting with questions that I hadn't I'd thought be of. I'm happy to. Well, that's difficult to follow, Bob. That's, um, you got everybody riled up with the ONF, uh, sitting next to Nan, and he kind of went, <gasps> I like that. Right? <laughs> Just so. go with the open flow. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bob, that was um, very inspirational and, uh, you know, certainly a great framework for today's summit on innovation. So, um, I put together some questions that I've been thinking about um, on those topics, and I'm sure the audience probably has some as well. So in the time that we have, we'll, we'll try to pick your brain about some of the things that um, you've learned over the years and all of your life experiences, starting out with you know, the, the Xerox PARC, um, legendary you know, invention of Ethernet, all the way up to um, your time now in, in Texas. So um, I guess the first thing is maybe um, going back, looking at uh, 1973, and um, if you look at the definition of innovation, it's really the process of inventing something new or improving on a process. So um, you described a lot about um, the feeds and speeds of you know, the, uh, the, the things that you were doing then. Um, I'd like to maybe kind of go to what were you trying to develop? What were you trying to improve upon at Xerox? What was your mission at that time? And what did you go through to, to get to that point? So I had been working in graduate school on the ARPANET, Internet 1.0, and there we were connecting mini computers together across the country. And I arrived at Xerox and it was a, my lucky day. So they gave me a problem that no one else had ever had before. What would you do if you were to have a computer on every desk? And how would you connect them? So I was the networking guy, they said, Bob, you connect them. That was luck. Inventing Ethernet was easy after that. The, the two requirements, uh, there were two. Mm -hmm. One was we were building uh, arguably the first laser printer, page per second, 500 dots per inch, eight and a half by 11, multiply that out, 500 times 500 times eight and a half times 11 is about 23 megabits per second. So to keep the printer busy, we'd have to generate megabits per second. So RS-232 was not looking like it was gonna do the job. Requirement number one. Requirement number, so imagine 255 personal computers. And this, believe me, th there weren't personal computers in 1973. There just weren't. So the idea of having one on every desk was, the, people yelled at you for such a stupid idea. <laughs> just think of all the MIS managers you'd need to take care of them. <laughs> the other nice. requirement was to get access to the ARPANET. So we want, oh, the internet. Then call the ARPANET. So that was an easy requirement because that, our access from our desk at that time ran at 300 bits per second. It was a Texas Instrument Silent 700. So the uh, Ethernet had to reach several, couple of hundred machines spread out over about a mile at some number of megabits per second and, uh, and, their, and gateway into the Internet. That was the initial requirement. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So um, to follow on that, in, in retrospect, knowing what you know now, um, what did you learn from that experience that you've been able to take with you through the years? Or what didn't you know at the time that you wish you had known? I'd like to be 27 years old and know <laughs> what I know now. <laughs> Wouldn't we all? Yes. <laughs> well, I learned about that um, it was the funnest time in, in my life, mm -hmm. and it's important to have fun. So when you're innovating or when you're working, you need to have fun. If you're not having fun, you should just stop immediately and walk out the door. All right, so occasionally you have to put up with, put up with it for a week or two. But if you find yourself doing it for years on end, 
get out of the place. I didn't have that problem at Xerox Park. As I said, I was very lucky. Resources and that problem, that magical problem that is really. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is we were building our own tools, and that's an old HP concept, of, uh, but that's what we were doing. We, were, we wanted to print our own documents. We wanted to do our own emails, so we, we were building something that was useful to us. We didn't have a requirements process. So maybe that's, uh, you know, invent what you know. And by the way, I'd like to argue with your definition of invention. Okay. I'd like to make the distinction between invention and innovation. And the, uh, uh, what I say about that is invention is a flower you know, grown in a hothouse, Xerox Park being a hothouse. So Ethernet as an invention was done there. What happened afterwards, innovation is a weed. So when you take Ethernet out of the hothouse and you print it, take it out into the real world, you don't find a bunch of people just dying to be innovated. You find a bunch of people out to kill you. I mean, the, the status quo, which at that time was the AT&T company and the, the IBM Corporation, both of whom dominated their respective fields, that was the status quo and very resourceful, powerful companies yes. um, who we eventually crushed. <laughs> uh, so okay. there's the, the, the distinction. So the other thing to have learned right. is the distinction between invention and innovation and or mm -hmm. the semantics there. So innovation is tough work and it's not a pretty thing. It's, uh, you have to be a weed and people are trying to put weed, weed killer on you all the time. Well, that's, you know, it takes us to, you know, the innovation, um, things that really foster innovation, but what things are inhibitors to innovation? What are you saying that would be a, a threat to that going forward? Well, uh, uh, very lucky to be at the Xerox Research Center, which was well-funded, and we were, uh, we had general direction we should do research that led to a paperless office of the future. Ironically, we built a laser printer and started producing <laughs> more paper than had ever been produced before. Uh, right. And you could imagine having a, having a job where innovation was less um, encouraged. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but another thing to learn, though, is I've found that the most unhappy people are those who, for whom uh, nothing is interesting. And this, ha this occurs among college students quite a lot. Uh, just nothing's interesting. And it leads them in really bad directions. So what I learned was that everything is interesting. So even if you are, don't work at the Xerox Research Center, uh, being interested in whatever it is you're doing is uh, really good for your morale and likely to lead to innovations as opposed to putting up with it day after day. So for the equipment vendors here, the ones that have um, achieved CE2O and others that will and service providers, what would you um, advise in terms of going forward in the business of, of fostering that within their organizations? Well, it's a spirit of coopetition. So we're all in the communications business. It means it's our job to connect things together. Mm -hmm. To connect things together, you need to have standards. And you need to cooperate on the development of those standards. You don't want them imposed. You want to cooperate on the development of them so they stand a better chance of being right. And then the competition starts. So it's coopetition, uh, uh, which is something I learned in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, a, it's a mindset to promote. For, on this project, we are cooperating. On Monday morning, the gloves come off and we start selling and engineering and uh, satisfying customers and competing our brains out. But we gotta get this part right. So this 2.0 and eventually the um, ONF inspired 3.0, <laughs> uh, we have to get those right and we have to set aside our competitive juices to get the standards right and then start the competition. Mm. So when you um, look back then, if we if look I'm kind of going back and forward, but the um, uh, 802.3 being standardized in, in the 80s um, certainly became de facto standard in the land. Did you ever conceive or think about how it was going to work in a metro or wide area network? No, Ethernet was uh, a LAN, and it got faster and faster and faster. But I never imagined it would escape the building. Mm 
but it has. It's escaped the building without my permission. And a bunch of people, a bunch of people invented that, and they think they're the inventors of Ethernet. Right. They right. I mean, have the right. face of Ethernet right here. <laughs> <laughs> He's the father. Oh, father. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. Um, I'm sorry. Another I, question. Did I answer that? Question? I think I think you did. I think you did. Let's so see if, about this one. Um, one more, and then I'll, I'll open it up to some questions from the audience. Um, what will replace Ethernet? Um, I'm not a good person to ask about that, but there's a funny answer to that. It's funny true, and I've watched this happen for 40 years. Whenever something new comes along and it looks like it's going to work, they call it Ethernet. <laughs> so the, this is over and over again. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, the, whatever this next thing is that's not Ethernet is going to be Ethernet right after they realize it's going to work. Uh, because the word Ethernet, that name, which I did name it, there's no dispute about that. Uh, that name has a business model associated with it, a vibrant, proven business model. And, I th and it also is a brand, really. And it carries with it implications. And when a new networking technology comes along, they mm -hmm. want to borrow all that. They want to participate right. in it. I don't know if you remember VG AnyLAN. They didn't always call it that. They initially called it some version of Ethernet. And I refused. I said, it's maybe a damn good technology, but it ain't Ethernet. And uh, HP eventually capitulated and called it VG AnyLAN, and then it died. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if they had succeeded in having it called Ethernet, it would probably would have lived. You know? <laughs> Who knows? It certainly worked. So, so then what you're saying is, as MEF members, the more they can use the word Ethernet, the better. Well, I noticed that they've stopped using the word Ethernet. Now it's not the Metro Ethernet forum. It's MEF now. So there goes Ethernet. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I've been very fortunate that that brand has, and it wasn't always the brand. That was the, you know, the nerdy name for the project at Research. And then when Xerox went to productize Ethernet, we changed its name. It was called, for four years, it was called the Xerox Wire. And they had TV ads and everything about the Xerox Wire. Mm -hmm. And then we decided, we managed to start the standardization effort and got DEC and Intel and HP and others to join the standardization effort. And they said, well, we'll go along with this, but we're not going to call it the Xerox wire. <laughs> what are we going to call it? And they fell back on the, the nerdy right. network uh, research name, which, uh, Interesting. which I came up with. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? I have more. Yes, someone in the back. Hi, it's Joan Engebretson from Carrier Ethernet News. Um, what are you seeing as some of the more interesting things going on with US Ignite? I'm just getting started there. I haven't uh, been to Chattanooga yet. I expect to see it all there. So th <coughs> this is the National Science Foundation and the White House, the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, it's, a, it's a jobs program. So things to get, it's coming out of Washington and it's, uh, but it comes with a point of view, which I've expressed already, much to the annoyance of many of you, which is that it comes with a software-defined network, open flow, gigabit. So it's gigabit and software-defined coming together. So I find that interesting. They, the, and they're the scientists. They, they're the people. These are the university scientists generally funded by NSF to develop new networks. And they're sort of converging on the idea of the software. The Genie network, have you heard the Genie, the next generation internet? Uh, so it's in my homework list to learn a lot more about Genie, and, uh, and I understand open flow is controversial. I don't see why MEF just doesn't immediately adopt open flow and implement it as 3.0, don't you think? No. No? <laughs> Are there problems with that that I haven't learned about yet? So that's interesting. But now there's the apps, the most exciting parts of the apps to be developed, and I, I tried to sketch how I'm going to go about it myself. You know, the disruption of education, the disruption of energy, and the disruption of health care. And the way you get into the details of that is look at the new forms of traffic that are being created. It's the traffic that disrupts the industries. You know, that is how that bandwidth is packaged, is 
web pages or uh, voice packets or videos or whatever. It's, so I tend to look at the traffics and how they're going to disrupt things. And that three by three matrix, you can look at examples of how, for example, how is uh, embedded traffic going to uh, involve healthcare? Well, constant patient monitoring, the constant monitoring of our bodily signs transmitted over the network to our doctor. So we, you know, the doctor will call us up and say, you're gonna have a, a, a heart attack in about an hour. I recommend you come into my office. And that'll be, th so that's in the box that says embedded, because it'll be embedded, and um, healthcare. Or you go up to the MOOCs, video, education, the MOOCs, the Khan Academy is a great example of where internet video is disrupting education already. Uh, and so I'd, I recommend looking at all nine of those boxes for uh, innovation disruption opportunities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Did we have another question? Yeah. Right here. Oh, I'm sorry, Nancy. Okay, uh, Lucy Yang, uh, as there's a, a computer virtualization trend going, moving, and the more and the more uh, network overlay or network uh, virtualization overlay application now, how do you see this uh, Ethernet position in the overlay application for, for network overlay? Yes. Uh, I don't think I have any insights there uh, particularly. Virtualization seems to be a trend in storage. It's a trend in uh, compute power. It ought to be a trend in networking. And I suppose that's what SDNs have something to do with, is the virtualization of network resources. That's probably what open flow is all about and why we should adopt it almost immediately without further consideration of any of its pluses or minuses. Uh, so, and what are the benefits of virtualization? Cost reduction, flexibility, automatic scaling, automated provisioning, so, um, so 3.0 is obviously going to have something like that in it, uh, automated provisioning. At, at a minimum, yeah. automated provisioning, e even if it doesn't well serve open flow. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't really have any uh, flashy insight there. So in addition to ONF that Nan's working on now, I know, that is there any other recommendation that you give to the MEF? this point? Well, full speed ahead. Congratulations and thank you to the 20 companies who are now certified 2.0. And that means we only have 60 more network equipment vendors to go mm -hmm. and 100 more um, service providers to go, not counting the service providers who have yet to be recruited. So one of the, one of the things we have to do is reach out of the first world. We have all these countries out there that have no internet at all or hardly any. And uh, we'll do those countries a lot of good by arranging to get them internet infrastructure. And so getting their carriers into the camp and get that infrastructure built, that should be a very high priority. Because greater connectivity brings freedom and prosperity. Uh, let me put a fine point on that. Freedom and prosperity is what this is all about, and connectivity is one of the shortcuts to it. Freedom and pros prosperity are driven by connectivity, and we've seen it. Uh, I've been watching it for 40 years. You connect people together, their, their markets become more efficient, with less friction, their democracies become more transparent. Uh, that's the first thing the uh, tyrants do, is they shut down the internet. So let's get the third world in on this, um, 2.0 and eventually 3.0 uh, movement. Look, so um, should we be looking to Austin for the next community of big, uh, big ideas after, um, you know, certainly you've been in Boston, you've been in Silicon Valley. Is Austin next? Well, Austin's a great city. Hook them horns. Uh, we have the state <laughs> capitol and the University of Texas and a seething startup community, not the scale of Silicon Valley, and we don't have as many research universities as Boston does, but there's a lot of startup activity there. I don't view uh, innovation or startup activity as a zero-sum game, so I'm not trying to get Austin to beat Silicon Valley, even if that were possible. Uh, I'm just trying to get, since I believe, I've watched and prospered in the Silicon Valley model of innovation for 22 years, I wanna see that 
more in operation in Austin, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, all everyone can stand for improvement. But I'm not out to beat Silicon Valley or mm -hmm. Chattanooga or New York. Uh, we should help them all right. learn how to innovate. Right, and I um, I understand that in the Silicon Valley area, there's something very big going on in May that maybe you can share some details with us about? Yes. Oh, and imagine, look at, there's a slide of him. You all are now <laughs> formally invited by slide <laughs> to attend Ethernet's 40th birthday. This, org, uh, this event will be, is being jointly sponsored by the Palo Alto Research Center, where Ethernet was invented, by the Computer History Museum, which is interested in history, and by MEF itself. It'll be at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California on the 22nd and 23rd. And there's really three events. The 22nd is a conference on innovation uh, using Ethernet as its case study. Then there's a party the evening uh, of the 22nd, the gala birthday party. And then the next day is an industry briefing, uh, updates for um, journalists and others on the state of the Ethernet industry. So please, uh, please plan to come. Yeah. Well, congratulations after 40 years. That's, that's great. Excellent. My wife asks, what have you done for us recently? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Bob. This has been thank great. You. Thank you.